<clears throat> Not everything is for the good. What else you want to talk about? <laughs> I was sitting in the airport in Chicago about a year ago. This guy comes, sits down next to me. He's a missionary. And he says, you know, every word in the Bible is true. The word of God. And he goes on for about 15 minutes how every word in the Bible is true. And then he remembers his manners and he says, oh, excuse me, uh, what is your relationship with the Bible? See, so he used the word relationship. I'm a Kohen, which means that Aaron is my grandfather, <laughs> which makes Moses my uncle, and Miriam is my aunt. So I said, my relationship? Aaron's my grandfather. <laughs> His mouth fell open. He didn't know what to say. And he mumbled something and he walked away. The point of the story is, I sat there wondering, he just finished lecturing me about the truth of the Bible. Every word in the Bible is true. So when I said, yeah, he's my grandfather, <laughs> why was he so shocked? Why was he speechless? It seems like there are different meanings to the word true. When he said every word is true, he didn't mean like true. He meant like it's what we believe to be true. He's your grandfather? Not that true. So here's the difference. For the rest of the world, the Bible is the bestseller of all times. It's the greatest book. It's the Word of God. What is it to us? We don't call it Bible, because Bible means book. To us, it's a family album. Our name is on every page. Speak to the children of Israel. The children of Israel blew it again. It's our history. It's our diary. It's the book of us. So do you have to be religious to read it? Well, you don't want to know about your grandfather. You want to know how, gra how old your grandmother was when she passed away? You don't want to know that? Tell you what your chances are? <laughs> Your grandmother was 127. Look forward to a long life. <laughs> but i got to tell you a story. Years ago, I was invited to speak in Argentina. From Minnesota, I live in Minnesota. The flight was from Minnesota to New York to Miami to Chile and then to, to, uh, to Argentina. Buenos Aires. I don't fly well. I hate it. Uh, it's uncomfortable. I suffer through it. And this was a particularly difficult, long Faschleptekrank. <laughs> when I finally arrive in Buenos Aires, the Schliach there picks me up. We're in the car. We're driving along. And he says, uh, by the way, there's a woman in town who suffered a terrible tragedy. She is severely depressed. She hasn't come out of her apartment in six months. And she refuses to talk to anybody. But when we told her you were coming, she agreed to talk to you. So we'll stop at her apartment on the way to the hotel, and you'll talk to her. I was furious. I couldn't believe it. She's severely depressed. You'll talk to her. Now, you talk to her. <laughs> what do you say to somebody who's severely depressed? Yeah, you'll talk to her. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Secondly, it has to be on the way to the hotel. She, she's depressed for six months. She can't wait another day. <laughs> but what bothered me the most you didn't even tell me. You didn't ask me. You didn't warn me. You didn't tell me. What is this? But she's expecting us. So we have to go. We come into the apartment, and this woman literally looks 
like she has passed away and nobody told her. There was no life in her eyes. There was no tone in her voice. There was no color in her skin. I mean, she hadn't left the apartment in six months. She looked terrible. She tells me the story, 19-year-old son, driving back from their country home, or their lake home, whatever it's called there, to get back into town in time for Rosh Hashanah. Gets into a car accident. His friends who were with him in the car survive. He does not. And then she tells me what a fantastic kid he was. What an exceptional, respectful, helpful, all, all, all the great qualities. He had them all. She finishes. What can you say? So I said, you know, uh, that sounds like a fantastic kid you had. And you had him for 19 years. She was not impressed. So I said, imagine if there was no shock. The shock is terrible. Perfectly healthy kid, here one day, gone the next. That's horrible. But imagine there was no shock. Imagine God comes to you and says, there is this fantastic soul in heaven. He needs to be born and live for 19 years. I'm looking for someone to be his mother. Would you please be his mother? No surprises, no shocks. I said, what would you have said if God had asked you? I was sure she would say yes. Most people would. She said, absolutely not. Without thinking, I said, well, it's a good thing he didn't ask you. The floodgates opened up. She cried like she needed to cry for the last six months. And in front of my eyes, she came back to life. Literally, literally the resurrection. She came back to life in 20 minutes in front of my eyes. It was the most incredible, the most emotional, the most, it was so, I mean, everybody who was there couldn't, there were no words. Now we're back in the car, going to the hotel room. And I'm thinking, I was so angry because they didn't ask me. And then I thought, if they had asked me, what would I have said? <laughs> I would have said, absolutely not. <laughs> and it would have been the wrong answer. Because I would not give up that experience for anything. I would say that in 50 some years of talking to people, that has got to be way up there as the most significant, most amazing, to say no to that, you gotta be crazy. And I would have been crazy. <laughs> and I would have said no. So from then on, somebody says, would you like to do, yes. Because who knows what I'm gonna miss out on if I say absolutely not. The moral of the story is that uh, it's a good thing that God doesn't ask us. Because we would just embarrass ourselves with the wrong answer. You want a challenge in your life? Not particularly, no. You want an uphill struggle? <laughs> Absolutely not. Want to get married? Mm. Not if I don't have to. <laughs> would you like to have a dozen kids? What, what would we amount to if, if we got to choose? So it's really a good thing. God doesn't ask. He has more confidence in us than we have. So he puts things on our plate without asking, without warning. Here, you handle it. As a people, that has certainly been our history. 
every time we think we're okay, we settle down a little bit, we get a little comfortable, we feel a little secure, out. If you would have asked us, would you like such a history? <laughs> we would have said no. So here's, here's the real answer to the question tonight. <clears throat> there are two realities that God created. Number one, he gave non-existent things an existence. It wasn't, then it was. God said, let there be, and there be. So it existed. Then God gave everything that exists a life. He breathed life into the now newly existing universe. So everything in the universe has an existence and it has a life. We should not confuse the two. Life, living, and existing, very different. Sometimes they're even at odds. Sometimes what's good for your existence is not so good for your life. And sometimes what's good for your life is not so good for your existence. Let's get a definition. What does it mean to exist? Literally, scientifically, what does it mean, this is? Before you tell me what it is, what? What does it mean that it is? The scientific answer, and the same is true in Kabbalah, to exist means to take up space. If it occupies space, it exists. If it doesn't occupy space, it's not here. Everything in the world occupies space. Even ego. Your ego occupies space. A thought in your brain occupies brain space. So you can't think two thoughts at the same time. Your mind is pre-occupied. An emotion takes up space. Of course, emotional space. That's why if you have two emotions at the same time, eh, they take you away. <laughs> <laughs> You're going a little mishuyan. Right? <laughs> Air takes up space. Fire takes up space. Water takes up space. And what does it mean to take up space? Very simply, another one can't come in. The book on the, on the shelf doesn't allow another book. A thought in your brain doesn't allow another thought. That's existing. Human beings have an existence and we have a life. But with our existence, like with any organic uh, living creation, our existence comes with many conditions. So if you talk to a person and say, how are you doing? How am I doing? I have a place to live, I have what to eat, I have what to drink, I have a good sleep, I'm in good health, and I have enough money for the next hundred years. What have you accomplished? You exist. Because to exist, you need to eat. To exist, you need to sleep. To exist, you need protection, you need security. So when you have all of that, what have you accomplished? You can continue existing. Which means you can get up tomorrow and eat again. So that you can exist for the next day. That's existence. So, existence means taking up space. It also means using up resources. Because your existence is conditional. What is life? Life is the effect you're having on the world around you. The effect you're having on others. The contribution your existence is making, that's your life. 
And that's why a person who genuinely feels that they're not making a contribution cannot stand their own existence. They become suicidal. In the human being, there are many times when my existence and my life are pulling me in opposite directions. For example, if I lived on an island and the island was all mine, I would have my space. The, the space I occupy would be large, it would be all mine, no threats, no interference. I would have a great existence. If I came here earlier and had this whole room to myself, I would feel very good. My existence is comfortable. But I've tried talking to empty rooms. It's not a life. <laughs> That's not living. So the fact that you're here taking up all that space, leaving me just with this little bit of... My existence objects. So I hate you. <laughs> we can be honest, right? <laughs> you diminished my existence? Why would I like you? On the other hand, I'm really glad you're here, and I love you for coming because, you know, when you talk to an empty room, they think you're a little weird. So for my life, you're very good. For my existence, you're very bad. And that's true of every relationship. The fact that there's another human being on planet Earth bothers me because you stole half my space. <laughs> you want proof? Cain and Abel. There wasn't enough room for both of them. On the other hand, a human being alone without another human being is not alive. It's not life. God created Adam and he was perfect and he was miserable because there was just him. When there's a conflict between existing and living, what's the solution? The obvious solution is give up the existence. What's it good for? It'll get you depressed. In fact, that may be what depression means. Not, I'm not talking about clinical depression. But you know, that, that mood when you get where you can't answer a phone, where you can't get up. What is that? Existing is embarrassing to a human being. A little depressing, just to exist. Got to eat, got to sleep, got to worry, got to do. And then what have you accomplished when you eat and drink and sleep? You took up space. What, are you going to be proud of that? So if there's a conflict between living and existing, give up the existing. What do you need it for? If you fight for your existence, if you're worrying about your existence, you put energy into your existence, you're making it heavier than it already is. It'll eventually become so heavy that you can't carry it. Your own existence has become too heavy. It's crushing. What is the solution? Stop existing so much. Find somebody who has a real problem and help them. And all of a sudden you have a life. But to do that, you have to give up a little of your existence. You've got to go out of your comfort zone. So if you think that every song is about you, You're not just vain. You're going to get depressed. <laughs> because if every song has to be about you, it means that you're taking up way too much space. You got to be the subject of every song? Rain it in. <laughs> Can't be that big. Can't take up all that space. 
The same is true, say this is the definition of depression. This is also why human beings are always asking this eternal question. Why are we here? And it's a painful question. Why are we here? What's the purpose? My question is, why do you need a purpose? You doing okay? Stop complaining. <laughs> why are we here? Where do you want to go? <laughs> you know of some other place? Where is this question coming from? It's like we just arrived here, we don't know what we're doing here. We've been here 5,000 years. Settle down. <laughs> what is this question? We get really confused when we word the question incorrectly. Say, what is the purpose of life? <laughs> now you're so fablungit, you'll never untangle yourself. The question is, what is the purpose of existence? Because existing needs a little justification. So what have you done lately? Took up space. And what does take up space mean? It's my chair, get off. This is it. This is why we're here. Come on, there's got to be more to it than that. So every sensitive, intelligent human being runs around saying, why are we here? What does that mean? Why are we taking up space? There's got to be more than that. And what is the answer? What justifies your existence? Life. If you're living, you're making a contribution, you're making a difference, then you have a right to exist. A little bit. In our history, everybody marvels. The Jew is still here. How come? Everybody else is gone. The Jew is still here. It frustrates historians, sociologists. You mess up every theory. Because by the theory, you shouldn't be here anymore. And yet we're here. Mark Twain said, other nations came and made a vast noise. And they're gone. The Jew is still here. Showing no signs of... Uh, of aging. You know what that means? Still making trouble. <laughs> so everybody marvels, but what's the answer? How come we're still here? I was in Rome speaking, finished my work there, got into a taxi to go to the airport. And there's a street there, I forget what it's called. The pedestrian traffic is immense. People strolling, crossing, walking. Cars can't move because of the pedestrians. So we're sitting there. So I said to the non-Jewish taxi driver, I said, you know, these Romans are going to make me miss my flight. <laughs> As if Romans haven't done enough damage. <laughs> Destroyed our temple. Now, now they're going to make me miss my flight. <laughs> he says, they're not Romans. There are no Romans. The only people still here from those days are the Jews. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? So what's the answer? What is the secret? What are we doing different? Oh uh, yeah, we, we suffer well. <laughs> what kind of answer is that? What did all these other nations want when they became great nations and made a vast noise? What did the Romans want? What did the Greeks want? What did the Babylonians want? Rule the world. <laughs> they wanted to guarantee their own existence. Bigger, take up more space, have more power, have more wealth, so that they will exist forever and the sun will never set on their empire. That's what they wanted. They wanted to exist. You see what happens? <laughs> you really, really want to exist, and all of a sudden you're not. Or you're very depressed. 
our history was different. You read it in the Torah and it's like shocking. Jews are about to enter the promised land for the first time. Moshe gets up and gives them a farewell speech and a pep talk, and he says, you're going to go into the land of milk and honey. It's the promised land. You finally got here. Eh, it's not going to last long. You'll settle down. You'll build some homes. You're going to get thrown out. You're going to be scattered to the four corners of the heavens. You're going to be reduced to a fraction of your number. You're going to be in, in other nations' lands where you are not welcome, and they're going to torture you. You're going to go crazy by what... And it goes on and on for about three pages. <laughs> really, really difficult to read. It's so bad. So the people there at the time were saying, uh, your point is, <laughs> this is really depressing. What are you telling us? Moshe said, what I'm telling you is that in your history, you are not going to have a good existence. You will not have a place of your own. You will not be allowed to occupy your own space. Certainly when you're in other people's country, but even when you're in your own, they won't let you. You're not going to have a comfortable existence. Here you won't be able to have real estate. There you won't have what to eat. Here you won't have shoes. Here they'll throw you out. Your existence is going to be miserable. So what should we do? Moshe said, forget about it. You be busy living. And that's what we did. In the worst times, when our existence was diminished to Next to nothing, we produced scholars, we wrote books, we instituted charity funds, color funds, uh, travelers funds, the best social services in the world. There was a Jewish community needed something from the government in Poland. So they made a plan, they're going to invite the governor and show him all the great things that they do, how they treat the stranger, how they treat the poor, and so on. And then they'll ask him, and he'll give them the money they need. They had one little problem, the Hasidic shtibel. It was a wreck. People coming, going, sleeping, eating, davening, screaming, crying, <laughs> laughing. The, they were not proud of this place. So they made a plan that they're going to take the governor around that street and skip that street and show him everything else. Make a long story short, they were skipping the street and the governor said, what's on this street? They said, nothing, no, nothing. They said, what, every street had something? They said, no, not this street, has nothing. The governor said, well, let's go, let's see it anyway. They come over, they look in the window. This guy is sleeping on a bench. This guy's having lunch from a paper bag. This guy is singing at the top of his lungs. This guy is sitting there learning from a book. The governor says, what is this? And they said, this is where we keep the insane. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Meshugoyim Hoyz. The governor said, what a brilliant idea. Because in those days, the Mishagayim roamed the streets. So what an idea. Get them all together. Wow. Anything you want. <laughs> Moral of the story is, as long as we're Mishagayim, let's do it together. It's nice. It's good. Anyway, so what is the secret of our survival? We are busy living even when existence is terrible. So yes, our existence is nothing to write home about. But our life, we are so alive. This is also what's wrong with teenagers. Ah, you see? Now I got your attention. What is wrong with teenagers? What is so impossible about being 16? Any teenagers here? No, it's impossible. So if you ask them, what are you angry about? I understand you're a little 
uncomfortable, a little bashful, a little awkward, you're changing, but what are you angry? They're all angry. <laughs> and you ask them, why are you angry? And it doesn't matter where, in, in, all over the world, in any language, they're the same. So if you ask them, they'll tell you. My mother ruined my whole life. <laughs> Teenagers are not good at fractions. <laughs> it's never part of my life, a little of, no, my whole life, ruined. <laughs> Serious accusation. But you see, you got to know the difference between existing and living. Your mother didn't ruin your life. You don't have a life. <laughs> You're a teenager. You have an existence, and it's hers. <laughs> my mother went into my room. Your room? You mean the room she lets you sleep in? <laughs> it's her room. So no matter how important you are, no matter how famous you are, no matter how powerful you are, you're sitting at the head of a meeting, the biggest people in town, and your mother walks in. Come on, she doesn't even have to say anything. <laughs> Mr. Big Shot, eh? I carried you, for, oh, right? Absolutely. She owns your existence. It's true. So, mothers do ruin your existence. They don't ruin your life. The other thing is, life can't be ruined. Life has no conditions. Life means, wherever you are, make a contribution. Even in a concentration camp, you can make such a difference. You can do so much for so many. Sure, you got your own problems, but that's your existence. You still have a life. Live it. Viktor Frankl found out that if you have a life, he doesn't say it in these words, but this is the idea, right? Logotherapy. If you have a life, you can handle the worst existence, and you'll survive. But those there who didn't have a life and they took away their existence, well, what are you left with? Life cannot be ruined. Life is not a burden. Life carries you. Existence you have to carry. So if teenagers would know the difference between living and existing, they wouldn't be angry. In fact, why is honoring your parents one of the Ten Commandments? Does it have to be engraved in stone? Your mother's right there. <laughs> She'll remind you. No chance you're going to forget. It's because honoring your parents means you owe them your existence. Pay up. That's what it means. It means they gave you existence. It's your turn to make their existence easier. And you will never give them existence, so you will never pay back. But a little bit. So if they're carrying a burden, you carry it for them. If they have to get food from the fridge, don't let them get up. You get up. Bring the food. It's menial tasks by which you honor your parents. What is death? The rabbi said, the souls that we are celebrating are not far away. They're right here. What does that mean? What's a soul? The question is always asked, is there life after death? Which is a ridiculous question. Are you alive when you're dead? What are you saying? If you're dead, you're dead. If you're alive, you're alive. What's the question? The real question is, can life die? And the answer is, of course not. Death can't live, life can't die. So what do we mean when we say somebody died? That their life ended? 
Don't confuse living and existing. When a person passes away, what changes is that they no longer take up space or use up resources. But are they still alive? Of course they're still alive. Life can't die. It's an oxymoron. Can water be dry? Life can't die. Anything that is alive can only live. So death means you ran out of space and time. You didn't run out of life. So the soul that had a life continues to have life. The memories are still there. The emotions are there. The relationships are there. All the values, all the virtues, and the regrets. But if you don't take up space, then you're not here. To be here in the physical, you have to take up space. In fact, in some way, they are more alive because they don't have to divide their energy between living and existing. All they are is alive. We're still juggling. I'd love to help you, but I'm hungry. <laughs> Shabbos. God says to us, six days out of the week, make your existence better. If something is broken, fix it. If the food is cold, heat it up. If it's too hot, cool it off. Make your existence more comfortable. Make some money, buy some stuff, So, what is Shabbos? Shabbos means six days of the week. By all means, make your existence better. But one day out of seven, leave your existence alone. Let it be. Whatever it is, it is. One day out of seven, focus on life. Forget what you need. Think of who needs you. That's the difference between living and existing. Living means I am needed. Existing means I have needs. And if I have needs, then I'm needy. I'm already getting depressed. Just from the word alone. Are you needy? That's it. You see how depressing that is? Needy is existing and it's depressing. To be needed, you'll overcome every obstacle if you know who needs you. You will get there by hook or by crook, but you will be there because you're needed. Unfortunately, children today are raised with nothing but existence. You tell your child, don't ever lie. Sounds good, no? A principle in life. But then we ruin it. Don't ever lie. Because, you know, if you lie, no one will believe you even when you're telling the truth. And then your existence is going to get messed up. So it's back to existing. Study. Study. Get good grades. But then we ruin it. Get good grades so that you'll get into a good school, so that you'll get a good job, and you'll have stuff. <laughs> so we reduce it back to existing again. He would say, share. Your friend came over. Share your toys. Sounds good? And then we ruin it. Share your toys. Don't be a fool. He's got toys. <laughs> you share with him, then when you go to his house, he'll share with you. His toys are much nicer. <laughs> what do we tell children about life? We tell them how to cross the street, how to ride a bicycle, how to brush their teeth, how to avoid strangers. And then, if they do all of that, then they can do it again tomorrow. Where's the life? You tell a child to say a blessing over the food. Little thing, right? 
You can exist without a blessing. So people say, I don't find that necessary. <laughs> you don't find it necessary for your existence. So I stop a guy in the street. I say, I'd like to put on tefillin. He said, oh, I don't need that. I said, great, come, let's put them on. He said, no, I really don't need that. I said, I know. If you needed to put on tefillin, I wouldn't even talk to you. You'd be so weird. <laughs> I, I, I need leather boxes. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> or this woman says, I tried keeping Shabbos, but <laughs> I don't need this. I said, I know. You didn't create the world in the six days. <laughs> why, why did you think you needed it? Every mitzvah is about life, not about existing. So you say, make a blessing when you eat a cookie. Why? I can, I can exist without it. Yeah. But the same is true of marriage. A man says to a woman, please marry me. I can't live without you. Should she marry him? It's not a trick question, it's a simple question. <laughs> See, if he means it, she should definitely not marry him. <laughs> Recommend a therapist, something. <laughs> you can't live without me and I'm going to marry you? <laughs> but on the other hand, how about a guy who says, please marry me, I can live without you. Honest guy. <laughs> Single guy. <laughs> what he should say is what God said to us. Please be mine. Marry me. I can exist without you. Like forever, <laughs> eternally, and infinitely. So yeah, I can exist without you. But without you... It's not a life. So every man should say to a woman, please marry me. Oh, I can exist without you. I can open a can. I can fry eggs. I mean, I can do all sorts of things for my existence. But without you just existing, not good. So marry me and we'll have a life together. The trick is, when you have a life together, you got to give up a lot of your existence. <laughs> so the new vows, am I going too long here? No. Jerry Seinfeld says, I never understood why at a wedding the bride wears a special gown. Nobody else wears anything like it. But the groom is wearing the same tuxedo as all the other guys. <laughs> Why is that? He said, then I listened to the vows. Do you take this man to be your... They don't mention a name. <laughs> Do you take this man? What if she says no? Well, there's another guy ready to go. <laughs> He's wearing the tuxedo. <laughs> Do you take this man? Don't you like anybody? <laughs> it's not like that. Marriage means, and this, we should actually say this under the chuppah, with this ring, I entitle you to be the only person in the world who can ruin my existence. <laughs> now come on, when you think about it, Don't hide it. Say it. <laughs> I hate people intruding on my space. But you <laughs> ruin my existence. <laughs> See if I care. <laughs> people get married and two weeks later say, I'm feeling a little cramped. <laughs> I'm suffocating here. Give me some room. No, no room. 
look at the vow. <laughs> you signed the contract. He's there to ruin your existence. But in exchange, you have a life. A doctor in the time of a plague doesn't get sick. He's treating all these people. He doesn't get sick. What is that? He doesn't get sick. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't take a break for eating. He doesn't take a, a break for sleeping. He's Superman. He really is. Until the plague is over. And then it all catches up with him. It's because a doctor in the time of a plague is so alive. His purpose, his contribution, he is so needed that he forgets that he needs to. His existence kind of disappears because he's so alive. That's Jewish. Maybe that's why doctors are. <laughs> <laughs> it's so Jewish to be so caught up in life that you forget to eat. Not just mothers. Even men. You're so busy living, you'll eat later. You'll sleep tomorrow. And it works. I have one final question for you. Why, when we take a drink, when we make a toast, do we say l'chaim? Hmm? L'chaim. It's a little prayer. To life. I don't want to die. Why do we have to make that prayer every time we take a drink? It's not that dangerous. <laughs> there are far more dangerous things that we do when we don't say l'chaim. When you get on a plane, say l'chaim. <laughs> You're driving over a bridge in Minnesota. Say l'chaim. <laughs> we don't. But when you take a drink, we don't want to die. <laughs> what, what, what is that? <coughs> and to make the question more interesting, there is a custom. When people make a toast, what do they do? They touch glasses. They make a noise with the glasses. Where, where, what is that? You know? It goes back to the times when people would never drink somebody else's drink because chances were it was poisoned. People were poisoning each other for some reason. <laughs> and you could not trust the drink. So when somebody really wanted you to drink, to make sure that you're comfortable and to reassure you that you're not going to die, they would exchange drinks. You know, I'll drink that. You drink this. So they would exchange drinks. When they stopped poisoning each other, it was no longer necessary to exchange. So what was left of that custom is that they moved the glasses to each other. It is not a Jewish custom. Because, you see, when a Jew needed to kill another Jew, <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> When a Jew needs to kill another Jew, he'll find some other way. Why would he ruin a good schnapps just to kill somebody? No Jew would do that. So our drinks were always safe. <laughs> and yet we're the ones who say, L'chaim, <laughs> don't want to die. When we say L'chaim, we don't mean life, not death. Who thinks about death? I've been thinking about the hereafter a lot as I'm getting older. You know, like I go into the refrigerator and I stand there thinking, what am I here after? <laughs> Comes with age. But we're not worried about death. When we say l'chaim, we mean I hereby choose life over existence. Why do we say it when we make a toast? Because what happens when you drink? 
Ever read about it? <laughs> what happens when a person drinks? They say that when you drink, you relax your inhibitions. That doesn't sound nice. You should never relax your inhibitions. What it really means is when you drink sufficiently, you relax your existence. You lose the concept of space. Isn't that true? How do you know a guy's drunk? If he's still standing, if he's still standing up. You know he's drunk because when he's sober and he wants to talk to you, he'll stand here in America. In South America here. <laughs> but when he's drunk, it's here. Say, so, excuse me, a little space? So you back away, he follows you. He's got no concept of space anymore. In fact, you buy a couch and the saleswoman says, um, this will seat three comfortably. It's not enough information. That's if you're sober. <laughs> It'll seat three sober people comfortably. It'll also seat nine drunks <laughs> comfortably. It's a fact. People who are drunk don't take up space. They don't get hurt when they fall. So now to the question. If it's all for the good, why does it feel so bad? The answer is, it's always good for your life. It's not always good for your existence. So the woman who called you was right. It's not all for the good. If you're talking about life, it's all for the good. They made an appointment for me to talk to a severely depressed woman. For my existence, that was bad. I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. I don't want to talk to depressed people. It's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> but for my life, that was not only all so good. It was one of the best things that ever happened. And how many experiences have we all had where we felt that something was really bad, something terrible, it felt bad, we don't want it, we don't like it, it's annoying, and then it turns out to be so significant. For life, for the existence, yes, it was, it was uncomfortable. Now we look forward to the coming of Mashiach. What's going to happen when Mashiach comes? Life and existence will merge. This, this separation, life is one thing, existence is another thing, that's the problem with this world. It's a world that needs fixing. Why does it need fixing? Because existing does not have a life to it. After we get finished with this world, we the Jewish people, after we demonstrate how life can continue and thrive. I agree with you 100%. Calling people survivors? That's pathetic. Somebody who swims across the Rio Grande and isn't eaten by a crocodile is a survivor. <laughs> but you come and you start a family. This woman was introduced last time I spoke in Texas. She was introduced. She spoke before me. She's in her 80s. And she's introduced as a survivor. And why is she being celebrated? Because she just donated $5 million to the Israeli Red <coughs> Cross. They're building an underground blood bank. And she donated $5 million. She's a survivor. <laughs> we should all survive like that. <laughs> so when I got up and after she spoke, there was nothing left to say. I mean, she was incredible, her experience and her. You know, we talk about the tragedy. Don't you realize the great victory? Look at where they came from and look at what they accomplished. Amazing. 
So all I could say after she spoke, all I could say was, eh, enough with the survivor. They need a better title, and I think you came up with a good one. Holocaust heroes, not Holocaust survivors. They're giants. So, suppose you love somebody, but you don't like them. Happens. I love you, but I don't like you. How do we explain this? If they're good enough to love, what's not to like? And if you can't even like them, how'd you end up loving them? Again, the answer is, I love you because of what you do for my life. I hate you because of what you do to my existence. <laughs> so what's the solution? One solution is stay drunk. <laughs> the other option is give up the existence. What, do you insist on being depressed? If a little bit of your existence can make someone else's existence easier, you come alive. <coughs> that's life. You give a dollar that you can use for your existence because all, that's all it's good for. The expression, I'm going out to make a living? No, you're not. You're going out to make an existence. When you come home, you have a living. But at work, in your career, at your job, you're making an existence. So you give up a dollar that's good for your existence to make someone else's existence a little easier. You now come alive. That's the Jewish secret to our survival. When I have only one dollar left, I can use it for my existence and then I'll be in trouble because that's my last dollar. <laughs> or I can give it to you and I will have life forever. Huge difference.